I think it's about time, right? Yeah. Okay, let's get started. Uh, hi there. Thanks for coming out. Uh, it's the uh, last day of the convention. It's an hour before lunch, so it takes real uh, confidence to come here at that time. Uh, I'm Martin. I'm the uh, lead DevOps uh, operations and support for Verdata. And today I will be telling you a little bit about what Verdata exactly is, um, who we are, and how we work together with NetApp in a story that's about hybrid and private deployments. So, uh, Verdata is actually an Internet of Experience platform. It's an extension of Internet of Things. So it's the new level that we have. And um, you heard during the keynote, Jonathan was talking about, it's all about collecting uh, uh, and moving uh, data around. So actually what an Internet of Things or an Internet of Experience platform does is it not only makes sure that we can collect that data, it allows you to analyze data on top of it and uh, build decisions, uh, make decisions uh, out of it. So it's a connected world. We're getting into a connected world. You can connect basically anything to anything, uh, which allows for the creation of new end user experiences uh, on top of these uh, platforms. We're starting to be able to correlate data between a huge amount of different data sources, uh, which opens up an entire new range uh, of possibilities. Uh, the Verdata Cloud, Verdata is a cloud uh, platform, a cloud service, a managed service. And uh, like I said before, it's a platform on which our customers can come in and build uh, new type of applications and create new value added services for their customers. Um, we have a set of client libraries that allow devices uh, that are uh, basically, any type of device can be an iOS device, can be an Android device, can be a Linux embedded device, system on chip. If you get into the blueprint, we have libraries that you can put into those and you can start ingesting uh, data from all those devices. Uh, we use a publish subscribe mechanism for our platform, which means that the communication is bi-directional. Uh, you can ingest data. Uh, from these devices, but you can also single out a device or a group of devices and send information back to those. Uh, we use MQTT uh, for that. And then we also have a set of rich public APIs that allow you to retrieve the data and work with the data as you were. Um, in origin, we uh, serve a number of vertical industries. Um, so one of the industries that we can cater to is automotive, where we can do stuff like uh, reading real-time information coming out of uh, cars, trucks. Uh, we can uh, store all that raw data in a, in a historical fashion. Uh, so, for example, you could have dashboard information that you can uh, retrieve in real time. Uh, or you can have an historical overview on the performance uh, of the car. Uh, we do stuff around health as well where you can have a real-time overview of complex sensor data, correlate that, and uh, make decisions based on that, uh, with, while also having the historical overview of a customer patient's uh, health status available. Then another industry that is very active is um, the retail industry, where uh, indoor location-based tracking is becoming more and more apparent and more and more to the forefront. Uh, where you can have services like when you enter a shop, uh, they know who you are, they know what your interests are, and they will serve you with uh, individual targeted advertising when you want it and when you need it. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple of use cases which will uh, show off the capabilities of the Verdata platform. Uh, I've got it sitting as a movie here, but I think we can take the chance and try to do a live demo, uh, which actually gives you a better view on its capabilities. So let me switch here. 
so what you're currently looking at is a uh, live multi-cloud uh, platform, uh, a public cloud platform, uh, where you can see that we have a number of uh, connected devices. We have about 180,000 connected devices uh, on this uh, system. And you can see the historical overview um, hour by hour. So it, it keeps updating real time. And you can also see the, the, the view over uh, time itself. I'm not going to go through all of the demos that we've built on top of the platform to show you. I'm just going to give you a small sampler. If you're interested, uh, you can always contact us afterwards and you can get a better view on the platform capabilities. But I did want to show you a couple of uh, use cases that uh, are, I think, uh, pretty important uh, to give you a sense of what the capabilities of the platform actually is. So for example, this is a um, automotive a fleet management demo that we have, where we have a set of cars that is driving around. Uh, we use an OBD dongle that is uh, in the diagnostic port of the car. Every car has uh, such a port. Uh, it's got a Bluetooth interface. The Bluetooth interface is reporting to the smartphone, and the smartphone is sending that data back uh, into the platform. So what we can do here is we can actually have a view on one of these cars. We can single out the car, so you can actually see them driving. Uh, we can go to its dashboard, and you will see the real-time uh, dashboard indicators uh, of the car, while you also have a visual representation of where the car is actually located due to a representation in Google uh, Street View. And another thing that's uh, quite nice to notice is that we're also recording uh, the driver's heart signal. This is due to a partnership with uh, a company called Olea Sensors uh, that retrieves the heart signal uh, from the driver. It's a heart signal, not a beats per minute, which, says, which means it's granular enough to identify uh, the person driving the car and which allows for advanced analytics such as detecting uh, very well in advance, 10, 15 minutes in advance, if a driver is going to fall asleep, yes or no. Uh, so this is the real-time capability. You can also go back in the historical view where you can uh, check out the trips that this vehicle has made in the past. And once you have that information available, uh, it will allow you to do uh, things like uh, cost calculations uh, in order to um, see where the car has been and how much uh, it actually uh, consumed. And I think here the gods of demos are interfering a little bit. Uh, so let me refresh that. So I think I just lost my connection. Uh, yeah, we did. So here we're back. Uh, so let's try the historical view again. So here you have the historical view, and uh, you can do a cost calculation based on the fuel consumption of the car per trip, uh, the duration. Uh, you can go back and check its route. One of the more interesting things, you can also go and check uh, the performance uh, of the trip, meaning that all the statistics coming out of the engine block are reported as raw data and stored into the platform uh, for indefinite uh, duration. One of the really good benefits is you can go to your car dealership and say, I have a problem. They will tell you, mm, we're not noticing anything. And you say, oh, look at the details. It happened during that time. And this is the problem that I was actually seeing. Okay. So it's a nice demo. We, uh, we found out that, yeah, there's actually a lot of people that can do something similar to this. Uh, so how do we differentiate us? Uh, one of the things that Verdeta in its origin always had was scalability. Uh, we did not take the approach where we have a solution that we're trying to scale out possibly to millions of devices. No, we started off with an architecture that allowed us to start from millions of devices and scale uh, potentially to billion of devices. So therefore, we uh, did uh, another implementation of this. 
And uh, currently what you will see is we have about 300,000 cars driving around that we can actually track uh, individually. Where is this data coming from? People are kind enough to publish their trip data to OpenStreetMap. We've taken in that data and we're replaying it to a set of uh, simulators, uh, which gives us the possibility uh, to give you this very nice feature. Again, it's not our intention to build these applications. These are applications that are intended to be built by our customers that create added value on top of the platform specifically for them. So this is another view that you have where we use uh, octagonals. Uh, so the previous one view that you had was a uh, heat map according to the density of the cars that we're driving. Here you will have a view that combines the actual speed uh, of the cars in combination with the density of the cars that you have driving around. Uh, so cars in this area 107, average speed 0 0.38 kilometers, meaning most of them are actually standing still. It's night time, so yeah, that kind of makes sense. Uh, let's go a little bit, let's dig a little bit deeper. And at a certain level, you actually start seeing uh, the individual cars, and you can see the cars uh, driving around. Um, our design is modular, meaning that we're using a different database as the one that I was using for the previous um, uh, demo, uh, which also shows the flexibility of the platform uh, in order to create uh, this overview. So here again, uh, you can track all the statistics of a single car, uh, and you can see it's actual, if, if I'm fast enough to, to grab one of them. No, I'm not, so let's try it again. Yeah, okay. Anyway, you, I, I think you get the picture. Uh, the, the statistics that we've shown before is exactly, oh, okay, here we go. Uh, so you can see the route and you can see all the engine statistics uh, in time series based uh, overview for each of these devices. Okay, so that's a little bit of view on the capabilities of the platform. We have others, we have health demos, we have uh, anti-churn demos uh, built on top of it, but I think you get the drift, I think you get the idea of, of the capabilities of the system so far. Now, how do we manage this? Uh, that's, uh, that's a big question, so uh, hold on, I'm not displaying it, okay. So we, uh, when we set forth to actually manage this platform, we, we, set, we gave ourselves a base of requirements that we had to adhere to. First of all, we had to be cloud agnostic. Uh, we had to be capable of deploying in any type of cloud. Uh, to this day, we support uh, IBM software, we support Amazon, we support OpenStack, and we're fairly confident that we can build drivers for any other cloud provider out there in a couple of weeks. Flexibility and elasticity. So um, we did not want to be bound by a single type of solution. We wanted to be able to mix and match uh, the components that we needed because every customer is different. Every customer has its own uh, use case. So we've got the pay-as-you-go model with a multi-tenant platform here, but we also want the capability that if a customer wants on-prem, uh, local, we can provide as well. And we also wanted to view that if you need a performance system, uh, you want to choose between performance and scaling wide, being elastic, you should have that as well. So bare metal versus VM, on-prem versus public cloud, all this needed to be supported in a single system. Uh, managed versus firefight, very important. We took a DevOps approach to the implementation, uh, meaning that we wanted to serve our development community, as well as our support community, as well as the customer community from one single point of view, end to end. I still think in the industry we need to have much more focus on the end goal, being we're not looking only at infrastructure. We're looking at solutions for customers. And you can look at a solution from a customer point of view, and you can look at a solution delivery point of view and it needs to be seamless throughout the chain. 
So that's what we set out to do. Only in that way you can actually manage a huge platform with a very small set of resources. That's the only way you can do that. And the good thing is I heard a lot of talks about microservices, uh, containerization. So it seems that, like indeed we're moving in that direction, but I still think it's the entire flow that's important. That's, what, that's where we should set our goal. Okay, uh, the space shuttle view on uh, our uh, deployed solution. So on the left-hand side, you see where the devices are actually reporting the data and when the devices where we're sending the data to. Uh, once you get uh, past the protocol adapter, uh, which terminates uh, your incoming message, it sends it on to the message queue. From that moment in time, we will not lose your data. It is stored. Uh, we store data hot for a month, and we also uh, store it in an archive, and uh, we can store it a couple of years. We can store it indefinitely. That's up to the customer to decide. But as long as you want, you have all your data. So if you want to do analytics on top of that, and at one point in time you get to a conclusion, okay, I was looking for the wrong thing, I want to revisit all my data, you can do that. You can just, from your object store, gather that information back into the system and do analytics on top of it with a service such as Spark, uh, which is also something that we offer. Um, yeah, I think if uh, covered most of this. So the Verdata deployment models, as I said, we have a full uh, public offering, a multi-tenant uh, offering, uh, where you pay as you grow, uh, which is cloud agnostic, can be deployed on any type of uh, public cloud, and you can have uh, storage solutions behind it that fit your need. Uh, we then have the hybrid de uh, deployment model, where we actually have two options. Uh, you have the option that I think is most relevant to most users, where you have a, uh, an enterprise uh, or a large uh, corporation that actually already has its own infrastructure and is ingesting data from its own devices and wants to extend that capability or needs to extend that capability with device data coming from the internet. So then you go to the hybrid model where your uh, messaging infrastructure is located uh, publicly, ingesting all the public uh, data coming into the system, and your data backend is on-prem, locally, taking care of all your data, making sure that all your data is uh, in adherence with your privacy uh, and uh, data concerns governed. And uh, in the meantime, you can also ingest data from within your intranet uh, possibility. So it's covering all the angles while you still have full control over your data locality and your data governance. Then you have the other option where you decide, I want the flexibility to really uh, scale out using VMs. I'm using the compute uh, from the public cloud, but I still want my, my data local. So you can have your storage solution locally while you use the, compu uh, the compute from the cloud. Uh, and then you have the private uh, managed service, so you have the convenience of a full private system while you still maintain all the benefits, uh, benefits from a managed system uh, like uh, the elastic healing, uh, the self-healing, the elastic uh, scaling uh, from the managed services. So how is it done? We basically um, took OpenStack and expand it on top of it, making it into a multi-cloud uh, management platform, uh, where we directly go to the APIs of the different cloud providers and start provisioning uh, the system on each of these cloud uh, products. Very important distinction is that we don't look at it point of infrastructure, uh, we look at it point of uh, service. A delivered service. So we take care of the infrastructure, we take care of the application, we take care of the, the, the health of the applications on top of that. All this on top, built on top of an OpenStack uh, solution. So the hybrid solution model, uh, a little bit the same, uh, uh, same feed, where we directly go to the cloud APIs, 
uh, so the 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 the, uh, the cloud provider has its own API. Uh, OpenStack has its own API and manager on top of that, and so you can see the hypervisor uh, details through it. But the actual provisioning, the actual governance of the infrastructure is done through the uh, multi-cloud manager. Same thing for the uh, private uh, solution deployment, where, where we go to a flex spot and provision uh, the services on top of that. So why OpenStack and why NetApp? Uh, we started on this road uh, about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, where we decided that uh, OpenStack already had a lot of uh, the capabilities of what we needed. It, it stopped at the infrastructure layer, but at least up until that part, it all made sense, what we were seeing. Uh, so with, and it was also very nicely compartmentalized in, in different services, which made it very easy for us to integrate whatever we needed on top of that. Uh, and yeah, the usage of the APIs, you, you can deploy OpenStack pretty much anywhere, so that made it a, a very good generic solution. Then the value of the, the uh, NetApp augmented OpenStack services. So what is very important to realize is that the dynamics of a public cloud environment are very different from the dynamics of a private cloud deployment. In what sense? For example, you don't care or you want to care, but you cannot, about SLAs in a public cloud. They, they, they're not giving you any SLAs in public cloud. So, but you, you can scale in pretty much infinitely. So if something goes wrong, you can have other resources, you can go to other data centers, things like that. When you look at the private cloud deployment, that's typically not there. People only want the infrastructure that they need in a private uh, cloud deployment, meaning that it becomes, um, uh, much more vulnerable to defects, things like that. So it absolutely makes sense to go for an enterprise solution as opposed to just having a bunch of commodity hardware and scaling out. That's the two approaches you can take. You can say, okay, I really don't want to care uh, about this enterprise grade thing, but then you will have to make sure that you have enough commodity hardware to cover all your bases. Uh, frankly, that creates an overhead in terms of your operations, and you will do, uh, have to do a lot more stuff. So it kind of makes sense to go for an enterprise solution if you go for a private uh, cloud there. Compliance uh, and security, uh, data locality, data governance, uh, law uh, governance, uh, very important. You want to be able to uh, state that you exactly know where your data is, what it does, and that it's, uh, it's actually under uh, data governance control. Consistent performance and SLAs. Uh, usually when you go to, towards an enterprise system, it's validated, it's tested. Uh, you know exactly what you get. You know what performance you should expect from it, as opposed, again, to commodity hardware, where you're usually mixing different systems uh, together with each other. You will end up with a lot of uh, issues if you scale uh, beyond a certain point. And full control over your private and hybrid clouds. Uh, one of the things you want to be able to do in a private solution, for sure, is you want to be able to direct where your resources go, uh, which is uh, something uh, that, uh, thanks to the augmented service, again, on an app is, is pretty easy uh, to do. OK, um, I will give you a short demo of the Verdata Multi-Cloud Manager. I will then show you a, a deployment of a hybrid uh, model using VPC and uh, a deployment on how the deployment on, an, on a FlexPot actually happens. A, a few things I need to tell you is that what we've built on top of OpenStack uh, raises uh, the, the view on the system. So we've actually started from release creation. So within the platform, I'm going to decide to create a new software release. Uh, when I click on the button, what actually happens behind the scenes is that I branch all my source code, I take all my attributes, I take my binaries, I take my uh, orchestration cookbooks and recipes, and I bundle it together in a release. Once that's done, I can provision my cloud providers that I'm going to be using in the system. I can have different. Uh, I can use different credentials if you want to do. If you want to switch between accounts, 
Uh, I create master images uh, from the system in order uh, to have a base that's under my control from where I want to start off from. Uh, you create the flavors that are uh, correspondent to the different uh, cloud providers. You create facets. What is a facet? A facet is basically a VM that has a, a very specific role. So what you do is you create a facet and you start uh, building your recipes. You, you put your recipes in your facet and it uh, then becomes uh, a certain VM role. On top of that, what we needed was the view uh, from a perspective of clusters. For example, if you use HDFS, you've got the naming node, uh, you've got the data node. They all serve uh, a single application. So you want to group those facets into clusters. So the concept of uh, clusters was introduced. And above that, you have the concept of an environment. An environment is a controlled service deployment. What does that mean? It's a set of capabilities, a set of clusters that come together uh, that are uh, orchestrated in such a way that they combine a single service identity. So for data as a platform is one of those services. We have another service, Spark as a service, that we do similarly uh, to that. And I will now show you a little bit of uh, what this multi-cloud manager actually looks like. So as you can see, it's, it's very similar to a um, vanilla uh, OpenStack deployment with the, uh, the main difference that there's an extra tab in there that says Verdata. And under Verdata, you can uh, find the concepts back that I just uh, mentioned. So under configuration, uh, you will get to decide which cloud providers, uh, which master images, which facets, which uh, flavors. Uh, you are going to have, you can set attributes uh, for your machines. Uh, but above that, you have the release creation uh, where you create your software uh, releases in. Uh, you can do event management. You can track who did what uh, in the service. And here you have an actual overview of the environments that we currently have. Uh, environments. Uh, so for example, one of the environments in here is our actual development environment. So uh, we've also added lifecycle management uh, to the capabilities in the sense that we uh, launch our development environment every day from scratch at 6 in the morning and we break it down at 8 in the evening when the developers are go have gone home. Like that, we save a lot of money and we uh, pressure the developers into making sure that stuff works because the next morning the platform needs to uh, come up again and work for everybody. So from an operational point of view, very good, good benefit. Uh, so I can just add an environment here. Uh, it willfully shows you a very nice name because I've been told that I'm terrible at picking names. So we included something that gives you a name for you. So summer snow, there you go. And I can start adding instances. I can uh, select my cloud provider. I can select the data center that uh, you want to go to. I can select the facet, the role that the VM is actually going to play. I can select the amount of VMs that I want to launch. And I can also select the release that I want it to play. So I can just add uh, one of these. So that's an EC2 instance. Uh, I can add another instance. Uh, let's make this one a software uh, instance. Uh, same software release. And then I will add one more, which is then uh, how we deploy on a FlexPod by using an OpenStack implementation. And here you go. So I now have three instances in my environment. So all the security groups are set for this environment to behave as one coherent uh, part. Uh, so I can now start the environment. 
some of the things I can do. So you will now, uh, the system will now go out to, to the different cloud providers, request the VMs. Uh, once that's done, when you've, once you get confirmation, uh, it will try to SSH into the machines. Once it's done that, it will start the orchestration in order to build uh, the applications on top uh, that you need to, to get into that environment. Some other things that you can do is if you decide to change the firewalls, you can, you can uh, re-provision uh, the firewalls directly through it. You can kick the system, meaning that if I change my software release, uh, I just have to kick the system. I don't have to rebuild the entire VM. It just rebuilds the software on top of it. And I can obviously set the software release uh, of each of the components that I want. Now, if, if you go into a production environment that we have, you will see that these environments are actually quite big. There's a whole set of instances here. Uh, it's, it's very difficult if I want to create a new environment to do that, so I'm not going to do that. Uh, what I will do is I will take that production environment, I will duplicate it, I will select a different cloud provider for it and a different data center. And uh, I will just duplicate that environment. Uh, which one was it? Red. Uh, so when I click in here, you will see that we have the, en and the entire new environment. And I just need to st uh, start it, and I have a duplicated, complete environment. So all the settings, all the attributes that are dependent on an environment have been set and have been met according to. Now let's go back to our uh, previous, uh, I think it was Black Cloud. No, it's not Black Cloud. It's a problem when you start creating all these. So uh, there you go. Should have another beer. That yeah, usually helps. Uh, OK, so now we're on the chef run. So where OpenStack stops is with the creation of your infrastructure. This takes it to the next level. This means that uh, what it actually means to be active here is that the application is up and running, it's healthy, and that is what uh, active means. You also have the monitoring capabilities associated with it. Uh, you can see the, the last events that have happened on it, and you can actually, uh, once the machines are active, you can download the, uh, the keys uh, for it if you have the, uh, uh, the necessary security uh, role. You can download the key and you can go directly into the machine uh, if needed. So each of the machines that we use has a different SSH key. So security is governed uh, as well by that. So that's that part. Let's go uh, to the monitoring part maybe a little bit. So when I go in here, you will see that actually um, I will get an overview. So we use Monit, an open source uh, packet as well. And what it does is it resolves all the dependencies that the applications have on each other. It checks them, and only then will the application be deemed to be uh, operational. And if needed, we'll, uh, make, uh, we will take actions uh, to rectify uh, any issues. So I will let the uh, machines actually launch. Let's see, maybe there are already some active. So yeah, so the uh, OpenStack based one is currently already active, and the other two machines are uh, still building. So that's all it takes to build a hybrid cloud environment in a system based on this. Um, we've also so this is for a, a normal hybrid environment. Uh, we've also done uh, stuff around VPC. Uh, that was a proof of concept that we've done, uh, where we actually uh, use NetApp uh, NPS private storage that's attached. So NetApp private storage, which is on-prem, uh, that you can then use in a combination with your uh, compute in the cloud. Uh, so let's see. it's this one, I guess. Let me see if I can actually play the video. So what you will see happen here is that 
uh, you go into the configuration and you go, uh, you have to import a VPC. It's an Amazon VPC. Uh, once that VPC is imported, uh, you uh, will be able uh, to use that in your environments. So here you see the actual creation of that. So you, you can actually see that it's the same uh, value as uh, what the NetApp uh, NPS uh, manager shows you. Once that is imported, you can then uh, spin up machines that are actually going to use volumes uh, of that NPS part uh, in your environment. Here you go. Now it's as easy as uh, in the environment selecting the facets that you need. Uh, when you create a facet, you're going to say that you have uh, the VPC capability and that you're going to attach uh, the volumes accordingly. So storage type, uh, NPS. We set the number of machines. So it's a Cassandra cluster. Uh, so the Cassandra cluster, uh, it makes sense to be able to take snapshots of your Cassandra as a backup and to be able to restore from it. So that's all it uh, basically takes for that. Now, let's first check on our environment. So uh, for our environment, two out of three of the services have already, becoming, have already become active. Uh, the third cloud provider is still provisioning the machine and will deploy uh, once it is done there. Again, this is an application point of view. Uh, that means that active means the application is uh, fully uh, functional and running on top of the platform. So, uh, in conclusion, why use a flex spot for your private and uh, uh, hybrid deployments? You want to have an enterprise grade solution in place uh, in order to uh, achieve maximum efficiency behind it. If you use commodity uh, hardware, uh, usually you're going to run into problems uh, in, in terms of manageability of that infrastructure, in terms of that you are going to have to work around the fact that there is always a contention between the amount of resources that you have in a private cloud as opposed to, to what you actually need. Uh, also, it becomes a lot easier in terms of customer compliance, uh, data locality, uh, and you have full control over your private cloud infrastructure and data. Um, okay, uh, that's a little bit in a nutshell what we do and how uh, we do it. Uh, so if you have any further questions, I'm open to suggestions. No questions? What are some of the benefits of having uh, using multiple cloud providers uh, in an application like your, in your example? Yeah. Okay, the, the benefit of using multiple cloud providers is that you're not tied into a single vendor. Uh, you can easily switch uh, over or you can e uh, actually combine them. Uh, in terms of resilience, uh, a certain cloud providers uh, have less uh, performance, uh, definitely the more immature ones. And you want to be able to go to one of the bigger uh, ones to, to make sure that your high availability is covered like that. Obviously, there is a cost associated uh, with that as well in terms of latency and architecture uh, around it. So you have to be very careful uh, how you do that. Uh, but that's the main benefit behind it. Any other questions? No? Then I would like to thank you and enjoy your lunch. Thank you.